Thank you very much and good afternoon. As we have all seen in recent weeks, the newest variant, the Omicron variant of concern, is adding new and more complex challenges to our pandemic. And we are no exception here in British Columbia. Omicron is uh, rapidly replacing the other variants here in BC, primarily Delta, the several different strains of Delta that have been causing infections around our province. And as we'll, we have noted, has rapidly started uh, causing in rapid increase in the number of new cases of COVID-19 that we're seeing, particularly in uh, Vancouver Coastal and the Fraser Health Region and here in Vancouver Island. It is moving quickly and so must we. This is of course not where we want to be. We were uh, making good progress. We had turned the corner of the wave that we've been uh, dealing with for the last few months here in BC. But it is the reality of where we are. And right now we need to slow the spread and ensure that our healthcare system and our communities are protected. We will see more cases. We know now globally that this Omicron strain is replacing Delta around the world. It is more transmissible, which means that it can spread with even a smaller amount of virus. It is spreading more rapidly than before, and we need to flatten that curve. If we see rapid increases in cases, we know that a certain proportion of those people will need hospital care. Right now, most of the cases that we're seeing are in younger people, younger people that are more connected, so it's spreading very rapidly, but they're not having severe illness. It's mostly mild illness, and that is for a couple of reasons. One, because people are younger right now, and also because we have very high vaccination rates, and that is reflected in uh, the people who are getting infected right now, where we have not had hospitalizations and people in the community who've had Omicron that we're aware of yet. But we know that we see the trajectory in countries around the world, and we're not going to be an exception to that. We will see rapidly rising cases over the next few weeks, and we need to take additional measures to slow that down so that we don't overwhelm our hospital system. One of the things that we also know is that if you are not yet vaccinated, if you do not have that protection that vaccination gives, this virus is spreading and more and more people are infected, you are at risk. Now is the time to get vaccinated. This virus will find you. We need to get vaccinated as soon as possible. With the odor of a vaccine, you are at higher risk of serious illness and hospitalization. We know now with this strain that even if you are fully vaccinated, you can get infected. But it is a, a milder illness for most of those people. So we need to put in new measures in place for everyone. These are revisions to the orders that are in place now and will be in place starting on midnight on Sunday. So we'll start on Monday morning and extend through to January 31st, 2022. These amendments are about ensuring everyone is staying small, staying with the people they know, and with people who are vaccinated. Firstly, the events and gatherings order will be amended so to include all indoor personal gatherings, including at rentals, vacation properties, resorts, are limited to your household or the residents, plus no more than 10 additional individuals or one other household. And this is if everybody is vaccinated. If you are unvaccinated or have members of your family who are unvaccinated, we cannot have personal gatherings in those settings right now. For events on our BC vaccine card, proof of vaccine with the BC vaccine card is required no matter the size of events. It no longer starts with events including 50 or more people, which has been the case for the last few months. In addition, we need to step up our scanning of the QR code. We know that that is the best way to ensure that these are valid QR codes and they must be checked at all events. Venues with a capacity of 1,000 or more people will be limited to 50% capacity, whether that's a concert 
uh, hockey game, uh, theater, if you're, the capacity is more than 1,000, then we are reducing that to f by 50% capacity. And that's to ensure that we have additional space for people. These are, are events that have been managed very well and we're not seeing a lot of transmission. But with this highly transmissible variant, we need to have more space more ventilation and we need to ensure that we are enforcing the mask wearing requirements that are in place for these events and ensuring that we're uh, scanning QR codes for these events. All sports tournaments um, that are both for uh, youth and adults are suspended for the period of this order. We have seen that when you have tournaments, which is teams coming from many different places, coming together over a period of days, those are events where we can see spread of this virus and then taking it back to different communities. I know there are a number of tournaments, particularly hockey tournaments around the province that were due to start on Boxing Day. Those will need to be suspended and postponed for the period of time of this order. Teams can continue to have games and to travel for games, but only when you're playing one-on-one -on -one in a limited time frame. Finally, under the events and gatherings, all New Year's Eve parties will be suspended, no matter their size. We can still have uh, restaurants can continue to operate at full capacity and can have New Year's Eve meals, but we also have some amendments to the food and liquor service premises order that will come into place on Monday as well. So restaurants can continue to operate at full capacity, but guests must remain at their table and, must, and masks must be worn when not seated. So this goes back to where we, what took us through the last few waves of this virus, um, of this pandemic, where you go with your group of people to the restaurant, you stay at the table together. There's no mingling and standing and, and mixing of tables. And this will apply for New Year's Eve as well. Restaurants can have a, that special New Year's Eve dinner and we are not putting any restrictions on serving of alcohol or hours of operation, but there can be no mixing of guests for receptions, for parties, and, and the uh, ban on things like dancing and other higher risk indoor um, activities remains in place. And finally, retail stores uh, will be uh, stepping up and we're asking you to put in place COVID safety plans for holiday and Boxing Day sales. We do encourage people to shop locally and to support your local businesses and we want to make sure that that can be done safely during this period of increased risk of transmission. What we want to do right now is limit those holiday gatherings to be only with our family and close friends. And I know how important it is for us to spend time with people. We have been through a lot in this province and we need to be with family and friends over this period of time. <coughs> Excuse me. And for those of us who woke up this morning to the earthquake at 414, as I did, um, sometimes it can be challenging to think, are we gonna make it through this year? We are. We know what we need to do, and we've been here before. We know we can slow the spread. We know there are many things that we can still do to support each other and to get through this. We can still host a holiday meal, but ensure everybody is fully vaccinated so that you can do that in the safest way possible. We can still socialize and spend time with others, but do it in a way that uh, doesn't increase risk. So if you have friends or family members who are unvaccinated, have one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with them or, or gatherings with them or do it outside, go for a walk. By doing this now, we'll be able to keep other important aspects of our community going. And with these orders in place, we know that it supports our schools coming back, post-secondary institutions remaining open and of course, supporting our, as much as we can our businesses and communities uh, functioning. We will be closely monitoring, of course, the situation and we'll make changes as we need to. That is something we've had to do. When we have plans and we, have, uh, we look at the, uh, the situation that we're dealing with on a day-by-day -day basis and we need to adjust and change when the situation changes. And this new variant has put us in that situation again.
I recognize that this unrelenting uncertainty and this evolving situation is very unsettling for many people and it can cause a lot of anxiety, depression and discouragement. I want to say that we can get through this and it is so important right now that we continue to support and care for each other. The days are dark right now, but soon the winter solstice will be coming and the days will get longer once again and we'll be turning ever so slowly back towards the light. Let's take encouragement from this. If you are feeling overwhelmed, anxious or unable to cope, we have resources to support you and I talked about this a few weeks ago. I encourage people to call 811, visit Bounce Back BC. The Kids Help phone line is toll-free 24-hour phone counselling. And you can call 1-800-668-6868 if you need that support. Let's do our part to help slow this virus down, keep our groups small. Let's ensure everyone in our family is vaccinated so that we have the best protection possible and support our friends, neighbours and communities. While there are restrictions in place, there is so much that we can do now because we have those tools in place. We do enjoy each other's company, the warmth, kindness and compassion of this holiday season and that doesn't need to pause. So I ask everyone, please continue to take all of the things that we know work to help keep us all safe and protected and continue to be kind, to be calm and to be safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, uh, I wanted to um, start by uh, expressing uh, my appreciation to people in BC who have done so much together to help one another deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, to thank our incredible teams of healthcare workers, our the more than 1,400 people who are working on contact tracing, which is not just a task of limiting the spread and finding out information, but supporting people in challenging times. BC, as you know, uh, there are some provinces that don't really do uh, much or any contact tracing. BC has continues to be focused on them. I thank them. All the people involved in our immunization campaigns and our acute care hospitals and community care in long-term care and assisted living in community pharmacy who are doing an exceptional job in challenging times. Um, you know, we've all made a difference, I think, by getting vaccinated, by getting our boosters when it's our turn, by making sure our children age 5 to 11 are protected with vaccine by following public health orders, by adhering to public health guidance, by using our COVID strength. And, and always, always, we're moved with conviction, compassion and understanding in adapting consistently to a vicious virus that lives to spread and spreads to live. This has not been easy, not for any of us, but almost two years ago, we committed together, I think, to fight. And we have done that every step of the way. And to have done so in such a way that supports one another as communities, as regions in the province, and as people. I want to note uh, that uh, as our pandemic experience has shown from the beginning, COVID-19 always has its own plans. Obviously, many of us, many of us who, if you'll recall last year, with limits on COVID gatherings, were unable to come together fully as families had our own plans for these holiday seasons. But as it's shown, COVID-19 has its own plans. COVID's Omicron variant is highly transmissible and each of us knows that with rising case counts around the globe, across Canada and here in BC, we are once again called to act. And uh, I want to note, as you know, today Nova Scotia announced its highest case count for COVID-19 ever. Quebec did the same. The uh, Omicron variant of concern is now the dominant variant of concern in the province of Ontario. And then around the world, we saw, as you know, more than 87,000 cases announced today in the United Kingdom, more than 10 times our rate of transmission in BC. And if you can imagine what the struggle that people in that country are facing. So I want to express uh, my appreciation to everyone and say that the measures taken today and being taken by Dr. Henry today and put in place and starting um, at midnight on Monday or at 11.59 on Sunday night, 
uh, are important steps that will help us slow the transmission of COVID-19 in a time that's challenging for everyone. Here in BC, for example, we see a growing share of our cases and we know even if we may be a week behind some jurisdiction in Canada, we know that, uh, that the Omicron variant of concern will soon be the dominant variant of concern in BC. So we have to continue to do the things that we are doing together to stop the spread and to follow the new guidance and the new, the new provincial health orders that have been put in place. I want to finally express my appreciation to all the people who are doing um, immunization around the province and note that the week of November 27th to December 3rd, we did 131,140 uh, vaccines were administered in BC. The week of December 4th to the 10th, it was 157,382. The week of December 11th to 17th, it was 182,805. Mm -hmm. We are ramping up those uh, vaccinations across British Columbia, and those include 84,491 first doses for children of 5 to 11, and a growing number of seniors and others in BC, 63% of uh, the, all those over 70, um, almost 50% of all those over 65, 130,000 clinically extremely vulnerable British Columbians, uh, tens of thousands, between 40 and 50,000 healthcare workers, a very significant number of Indigenous communities. The same kinds of priorities we put on dose one and two have been put in dose three, have been vaccinated so far, and those efforts continue and they will continue across BC. This is uh, particularly true with growing vaccinations in the Northern Health Authority, which has seen its vaccinations with, in combination with the First Nations Health Authority in, in, um, in communities across Northern BC, increase significantly in the last number of weeks. I want to encourage people in Northern BC, um, if they are eligible to be vaccinated, to book appointments. Uh, there are currently um, 1,800 uh, pharmacy appointments currently posted across Northern Health Authority. Only 450 bookings have been made uh, for the next two weeks and we can, I believe, move to fill those up uh, in, the, in this next period and again advance our immunization effort as well. Efforts are going to be made, every effort is going to be made to ensure that there are many opportunities through this Christmas period to get vaccinated in every part of BC and those, that work is being done now. So I think we need to continue those efforts, we need to follow the public health orders and continue to do the work we need to do together to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I just say this, that um, uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has tested us all and what it requires now is for us to uh, be cautious in our actions, be prudent in our actions, protect one another with what we do and support these efforts of public health which reflect, I think, the best advice we can give to British Columbians and where it's not advice, the direction and orders that we can provide to give people the best protection possible in challenging times. This is going to be a very difficult three weeks and we can deal with that in a number of ways but I think what we need to do together is continue to make the best efforts we can across British Columbia in supporting one another and supporting public health and working together to address and support each other in difficult times. Do it for our families, for our friends, our loved ones, our communities, for those we love and know and those that we don't know. And if we can do that together, we can achieve a great deal in dealing with this difficult challenge of the Omicron variant of concern. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow-up. For our first question, we start here in the room with Richard Zussman, Global News. I'm trying to understand the restrictions on social gatherings. So you have one household, they can invite over 10 other people or another household. How does this work with families that may have one other family of four plus two others? Like that's less than 10. It's, I'm just not sure how people are supposed to do this. And then the other piece of this is how are you possibly going to enforce unvaccinated people not being able to go to social gatherings, considering largely unvaccinated people have not followed along with provincial guidelines from the beginning. 
Yeah, so, you know, what I'm hearing very clearly from people is they want direction about how to do this in the best way that we can. And we recognize that people have to get together. And yes, so the number 10 is about having a manageable group and making sure that people are vaccinated. And this is to support people to have those conversations, to have those conversations with people who, and I know I hear a lot about um, how do I ask people about this? So it's it is keeping those groups small. It's about having those conversations about vaccination, having them ahead of time, saying I'm having people over on this date for vaccinated people only, can you come? That's one way of, of having that conversation without putting people on the spot. But I think it, you know, people want clear direction on how, what the limits are. So we say another household because sometimes we have very large households and if, uh, if you want to come together with uh, two large households, then that's enough. Don't have additional people. But the answer really is to look at your own risk and to keep things as small as reasonably possible. But a limit of 10 is one that uh, will reduce the mitigate or mitigate the impacts if somebody is happening to be carrying the virus. And it doesn't have to be 10. It can be fewer than that. So ha spend time with people that you want to spend time with or that you need to spend time with right now. Keep it as small as possible. Look at your own risks and look at the risks of the group of people that you're with. If you have people who are undergoing cancer therapy or immune suppression, keep it smaller than that and make sure that, you're, um, that you have good ventilation, that you're in a larger space. Those are the types of things we need to think through over this holiday period. You mentioned anxiety. There has been a lot of anxiety created around the issue of booster shots and around the issue of rapid testing. There's nothing here announcing that those things are speeding ahead. I understand that boosters, we continue to be ahead of the curve in some regards, but so many other jurisdictions are shrinking that gap between second and third doses to fewer than six months. Why are we not shrinking the gap? Why are we not announcing today that rapid tests will be available to British Columbians like almost every other province? Like what is taking us time to get to that point? Yeah, so there's a couple of things and I'll talk about the booster program um, in a bit more detail. Um, and. Uh, the, in terms of the rapid testing, we are working on that. Um, we are in a situation where we have certain types of tests, we're working on how to make them more available, and we are going to be talking about that in more detail on Tuesday. And I can't tell you things that are not yet worked out. So more to come on that for sure. And booster, I mean, I think we need to be careful about fixating on one thing or another thing as being unanswered. They are part of the answer and there is an important role for, for rapid testing. And uh, we are changing our, our focus on that. Um, and we'll have more to say on that. In terms of the booster doses, we announced this program um, based on what um, the um, thinking that we've been doing around immunology, around looking at the data that we have from, from BC, from Canada and globally, around how our immune system works. And we know, um, we went very early on, as you know, to increasing the interval between dose one and dose two, because we know that that gives the immune system longer, better time to be able to mature and develop, particularly what we call the cell-mediated immunity. And that's been proven, it's been borne out both in the vaccine effectiveness studies and in other studies that show that the longer the interval between dose one and dose two, then sort of the optimal is probably at least eight weeks, um, that you get a stronger, longer lasting immune response. So one of the things that's different about BC is we went to that extended interval early, which means that most people in BC were getting their dose to around the end of June, July, and the first, month, uh, first week of August. The second part is we also know that, uh, and NACI has come out with this as well, looking at information about different programs around the world and the programs here in Canada, that extending the interval between dose two and a booster dose 
also gives your immune system time to develop a stronger, longer lasting response. So the booster program that we started in October was focused on the data that we have that showed we were starting to see more serious infections and breakthrough in older people. So hospitalizations in older people who've been vaccinated and of course uh, um, uh, infections and outbreaks in long-term care. We know uh, from all of the work on immunology that our, our antibody levels decrease over time and that's antibodies are a protein in the blood and if we had every antibody to everything we were immune to our, our blood would be sludge. <laughs> so we know that those go down over time and what that means is that you may have less protection against that immediate response and that can lead to infection especially with a more highly infectious variant so a smaller amount of virus can cause an infection. But what we don't know and what we're learning about is how strong that cell mediated response is and we are seeing that that's giving good protection even against Omicron but we don't know all of the details about that yet. So preserving that, um, that interval between dose 2 and a booster dose gives us stronger better protection for longer and it will get us through not just this variant and what's happening right now, but also the next variant. We are going to be living with this virus for a long time. So we want to give the best protection, the strongest protection, the longest lasting protection. Initially, we had been looking at the data and expecting for, for younger people, we'd be able to extend that interval to about eight months because that's probably um, giving stronger, longer lasting protection for a longer period of time. But we've now moved it up and we're focusing on ramping up our immunization program so that we can get most people at about six months. And we did it a little bit early for some of those people at higher risk who didn't have a strong immune response. But we're, for most of us, it's going to be six months after your dose two. And that's what where our goal is now. That's what we're ramping up for. And for most people, that means in the next few weeks, you'll be getting your invitations and we'll be uh, getting booster doses into people. And just to add to that, uh, Richard, um, you know, I, I can't comment what people announced about the future. I can tell you what we're doing in BC. Um, uh, as I said in my presentation two weeks ago, 131,140. This week, 182,805. That's ramping up, not on paper, not in press releases, not in announcements, but where it matters in immunization clinics across BC. How have we done this? By adding community pharmacy, I want to thank the BC Pharmacy Association for this. I talked about the availability of appointments in different pharmacies, especially in the north, and they're available, but boosting them. So we've gone from 200, which were largely in our pilot project as we built it out, to 500 this week to 1,000. This is a significant increase in capacity to, to uh, deliver on that. I don't believe other provinces have done what we've done, which is to focus on the clinically extremely vulnerable and the well over 100,000 people who have got uh, their vaccinations. And this will be worth its weight in gold for those people and their families and the healthcare system and everyone in BC who I know would support people who are, are living with cancer and people who are living with uh, significant immune suppressing uh, disease and, and challenges that they get their uh, vaccine doses sooner. And we've done that in BC. We are setting the priority in the same medically based, science based approach guided by public health as we've consistently done. And you see those ramping up. And I think that people can be proud of this effort on the ground. And I'm proud of British Columbians because they're getting vaccinated at a very high rate, 92% of all those over 12. And we're seeing the growth in our, um, in our, can in our effort for children 5 to 11. So this is a very significant campaign. And I want to also say, that finally, that the challenges on our healthcare workers and our healthcare systems are real. We decided and we believe in BC in the importance of contact tracing. It will be tested as we see cases inevitably grow in the next week or so. But having a contact tracing team in place, the largest that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic, is important to help people in challenging times. That isn't the case in other jurisdictions. We have a vaccine mandate in long-term care and booster doses in long-term care and assisted living. 
that have reduced the number of, uh, of outbreaks from in the 20s at the beginning of November to zero in long-term care and assisted living as of yesterday. That doesn't mean it'll stay at zero, but that's an important place to start as we deal with this, these new challenges. So, um, and these aren't things that the government has done. These are things that British Columbians have done, British Columbia healthcare workers have done, and British Columbia citizens have done. And, uh, and we should acknowledge those strengths and improve areas where we can do better. Next question goes to Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Um, you know, might have trouble understanding why you feel um, that the risk of gathering in private settings with one other fully vaccinated household is the same a risk as gathering in clubs with maybe a hundred people. You know, when we know that aerosol can be spread that way, and uh, you yourself mentioned, you know, ensuring better ventilation, some people might, you know, have a bit of a disconnect between those two. Yeah, so uh, you know that in uh, in clubs we have limitations on what activities can happen in those settings. So people need to be at a table now. Um, particularly, we were allowing people to move around. The BC vaccine card is in effect, so everybody must be vaccinated in those settings. And uh, now you must stay at your table as well. So yes, it's a balancing of risks and trying to keep um, the things open that we can with those measures in place. Um, the other piece, of course, is mask wearing. And so in our indoor social gatherings, we tend not to wear masks, but those are important when you're uh, moving around within a, a restaurant, a bar or a club. And I know many of the clubs have not opened because we have had that uh, prohibition on, on things like dancing and other higher risk activities within those settings. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Do you have any data or any modeling to compare what the rate of transmission would be with this Omicron virus in British Columbia if you do not uh, you know, impose any further restrictions versus the rate that we might see with these restrictions in place? Yeah, so the, the short answer is not yet. Um, as you know, uh, it takes some, a bit of time before we are seeing uh, the numbers that help us understand that. So the modeling that we showed, particularly things like the reproductive number, was still based on mostly uh, transmission of, of Delta variants, although we were starting to see the increase in, in Omicron. And as you know, that was creeping up above one. And I believe that's the, inf in the influence of, of Omicron, particularly, uh, as I mentioned on Tuesday in Vancouver Coastal, where we started to see that uh, really curve up very rapidly. So. Uh, we will be looking at that as we are an analyzing uh, the data going forward, but it, there's a bit of a delay. Everybody is, is notified of their positive test, but the whole genome sequencing takes several days. So we are, um, right now, yesterday we reported, uh, we were up to 135, I believe it was, or 37 uh, cases confirmed by whole genome sequencing. And that process will be updated uh, uh, later today, I believe there's a bit of a delay and, and we're still trying to work out that process, but it's increasing in, in numbers and in percent. So we'll be able to do that in time. And that's one of the challenges we're facing with uh, this new variant is, uh, around the world is it takes time before you know uh, when you can look back and look at uh, what, are the, what are we seeing. But we know from Ontario where they're a bit ahead of us from the UK that uh, the reproductive number um, when it's introduced into the population is higher than what we were seeing with, uh, with Delta over the last few weeks. Next question, Lisa Yusta, City News. Um, Minister Dix, you mentioned contact tracing. I remember uh, back in the, well, not in the spring, I guess last winter, but it was that contact tracing in Fraser Health, for example, could handle about 600 cases and then they were overwhelmed. Now, fewer cases at this point, but increasing and the number of contacts or the number of people at risk is increasing. So how long will it be before the contact tracing in place is overwhelmed or will it withstand this? 
No, it will not withstand this in my estimations and I've talked with my colleagues about this. These are things that we talk about a lot about public health practice and what we will be doing and uh, we saw this in the north uh, with a much smaller number because we have fewer resources to be able to do that. So what we are working on and what we will be doing is prioritizing where we need to make sure that we are doing active contact management and you know, clearly a high risk settings like somebody who's a healthcare worker, uh, or somebody who's in long term care, um, in some of the congregate living settings. But then for people who are having milder illness, vaccinated younger people, um, being able to self manage and notify their own contacts and we'll be supporting them in doing that. And we've had to do that in, in some ways in the north, in the interior over um, periods of surges. So we are focused and how we do that in a systematic way um, should we get to that point in the next little while. And uh, I will also say that uh, you know, we're, we're that same pool of people um, is doing many things. The case and contact management teams being led by mostly public health people uh, with others working with us. Um, we're also people who do immunization. Also, uh, the people who are, are working on um, the data collection and outbreak management. So it's, it's not like we have teams that are able to do many, many things. So what we were doing is titrating up as we had our big bolus of, of second doses in the summer and then as cases rose, many people were moved over to support the contact tracing and case management. So we are actively looking at how we can manage that. Oh, and testing, that was the other piece. We do the testing, um, the testing centers as well. So, it, it, and you would have heard that uh, we've had longer lineups at our testing centers as we've started to see more cases. So the measures that we're putting in place today are to try and address some of those things. What we are seeing is rapid spread in large groups, large parties where UVIC, uh, unfortunately, is a good example where there's large host parties with large numbers of people and this strain is spreading very rapidly um, in those settings. But most people have very mild illness so how do we support people to be able to, uh, to, um, uh, to isolate themselves and test. And what we, uh, so part of what we're doing today is reducing the probability of having those larger gatherings and bigger spread. And just on the numbers, Lisa, I mean, we have more people on our contact tracing teams now than any other time in the pandemic. But you'll see the number of active cases, and I think you'll see it uh, today uh, at 3 o'clock when uh, all the numbers come out. But you see that we have, uh, I think, around 4,200 active cases now in BC of COVID-19. We had, um, as those of you who watch the numbers closely, you know we had probably a week ago 28, 2,900 cases. So that's a significant increase, and that's going to keep going up. And uh, so we've got a strong team and a strong network in place. But there's a point at which um, you have to uh, you have to assign the work amongst these people. And as Dr. Henry has said, it's the same teams of health workers that do contact tracing, but the same groups of healthcare workers who also do immunization, other work in public health, of course, work in other parts of the healthcare system as well. So that's, uh, that's the challenge we face. But that emphasis on contact tracing, we have the strongest uh, teams in the country, but as cases grow, we're going to have to adjust our strategies to deal with a growing number of cases. And uh, we've seen that in the last week, and we absolutely expect to see that uh, in, uh, in the coming days. We went, remember, from uh, average cases in the 350, 360 range, uh, seven day rolling average uh, at the beginning of this week, uh, in the 300s anyway, to the case numbers we've seen, low 500s, high 500s yesterday, um, uh, 759. Uh, and so you've seen that increase and it's going to grow and that's going to mean active cases are going to grow because that's a significant increase over a period uh, of weeks ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago and we're going to see those active cases growing up and that means the work for contact tracing is going to increase and we're going to have to adjust our tactics to deal with that. But we've got a strong team in place and that's always been an emphasis in BC and it will continue to be emphasis even if uh, some of our strategies change. Lisa, do you have a follow up? I do, and I think all of that is why people are so frustrated they don't have their hands on rapid tests right now. And, and going on from that, I think there seems to be a sort of sense of fatalistic 
sense that people just, even if you're fully vaccinated, you're going to get this. I heard someone I love say this soon, like, I just don't know how I'm going to prevent this. And it's her university students telling me that they're terrified going to exams now because although they're wearing masks and people are supposed to be vaccinated, people are showing up sick. So why not put even more stringent things on, protect like these large gatherings at schools right now, and why not make those tests available this weekend? Well, we can't make things available that we, we don't have. So we are working on that. And there's, a, you know, the, today is the last day of school for K-12. to We know that uh, cases have been very low at post-secondary institutions. And we have not had uh, transmission in classroom settings, for example, or lab settings in post-secondary institutions. It has been almost exclusively in those social events off campus most uh, where there's uh, not mask wearing, where people are coming together. So we have been supporting and working really closely with post-secondary institutions around this. And that we've had a very successful return to campus across the province in, uh, in BC. And I think that kudos go to um, the staff and, and the students in uh, post-secondary institutions. The vaccination rates in our universities and uh, um, colleges in BC are in the high 90s. I know in UVic it was 97, 98 um, percent. And that's reflected in the fact that even though this spread very widely in uh, the group of students in the, uh, in the social gatherings, um, they did not have anybody with severe disease yet. So that's good news. Um, I think we need to put this into a context. Yes, there's a lot of concern. And part of the concern is that there are just so, so many unknowns. And we've seen this happening around the world. And, you know, I personally hoped that we had enough things in place that we wouldn't be seeing it replace uh, Delta that we've been dealing with really successfully over the last few months. But, um, you know, the reality is that it has. So I think what we need to focus on is knowing what we need to do, um, taking a deep breath, knowing that, yes, it, it can spread and it can spread in those social connections particularly, um, that we need to use our layers of protection. Getting vaccinated is a huge, huge protection for us. And we know, especially young people, that we get um, very strong immune responses from the vaccines that we have, and that's going to help us. And for most people, it's a relatively mild illness if you're vaccinated. But if you're not, if you don't have that layer of protection, you're really at risk right now. So you need to um, really think again about um, protecting yourself because you are at risk. Next question, Justin Wong, Sing Tao Daily. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, uh, the BC government they will follow the Ontario government because they they have a uh, uh, recommend their employees uh, work from home. How about the BC government? Do you uh, recommend as well? Yeah, so the Public Service Agency has a, a, a vaccine mandate across the board here in British Columbia, and they have uh, extended. Uh, there was a return to work plan for early uh, January, and that's been extended, at least for the period of time of these orders. So yes, that is uh, what the Public Service is doing here in British Columbia. And our recommendations, advice uh, to other organizations is to, um, to consider continuing uh, your work from home if that's possible as well. Justin, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, uh, we want to know about after the Christmas and the New Year holiday, the school campus will be reclosed again. Uh, I'm sorry, will school be reclosed? Oh, yes, the university already universities for post-secondary institutions. Yeah. You know, our expectation right now um, given what we know right now is that we will be able to safely go back to in-classroom learning and I know many post-secondary institutions, I was mentioning this, uh, are really taking the best of some of the remote learning and doing some hybrid, particularly to be able to support students and staff if they get sick and, and need to um, be out of the classroom for a period of time. So the measures that we have in, in place in post-secondary institutions have been working really well. Of course, 
things are changing. So we will be watching this carefully over the next few weeks um, and we'll be uh, talking. Uh, we have a, a group that meets regularly with post-secondary institutions um, to make sure that we have the right measures in place uh, and we'll be reviewing those before a return to campus. But um, I am confident that we can continue to support our young people who've been so differentially affected by this pandemic. And we know how hard it was uh, for so many young people with the, uh, the uh, completely remote learning um, last year. And it is important. We know that it's a time when people are uh, developing emotionally and socially and finding ideas and sharing ideas with new people. And part of that um, needs to happen in an environment that is uh, on campus. Next question, uh, Rob Buffum, CTV Vancouver Island. Oh, hi. Thanks for taking my question. I'm wondering about um, for parents of, of younger kids going to high school or elementary school who are anxious about the return to school in a couple of weeks, we're expecting a surge in cases. What can you tell those parents in terms of the likelihood that their kids will be back to class in person? Yeah, we're, we also, uh, you know, have had a really strong focus on safe return to school and that has been also really successful. Um, I think right now focusing on getting the younger kids vaccinated, if you're in the 12 to 17 and have not yet received your vaccinations, that's important too. And the measures that we've been putting in place have been working. So we need to focus on that and our school team is also uh, meeting regularly and we'll be looking looking at how do we ensure that we have everything in place that's needed for a safe return to school in two weeks. And today uh, being the last day for K-12 here in, uh, in BC. Rob, do you have a follow-up? I do. As you know, the hospitality industry was very upset last New Year's Eve when at the 11th hour there was significant restrictions brought in. You've brought in some restrictions today, uh, acknowledging that there is going to be a surge in cases. How confident are you that we are not going to see more restrictions things like capacity limits at restaurants or, or things of that nature in the next several weeks. Yeah, so we've been looking and I've been working with my colleagues about where we're seeing transmission happen and uh, particularly in Vancouver and it really is those uh, those social interactions in those settings where we're not wearing masks when we're talking and being together and, and whether it's a party at a restaurant. So we know and we've seen this throughout this pandemic that restaurants can safely function when we have some of these COVID safety measures in place. So that's why we've made uh, the measures that you have to stay at your table with your group, um, wearing masks again, checking the QR code, making sure everybody's vaccinated. And I met with uh, industry representatives this morning and we talked through these things. These are the measures that I'm confident will help us to continue safely operate. Clearly, if the situation gets dramatically worse, then we'll meet again and reassess what we need to do. But I believe that if we all dig in and, and stay small and continue to, to take these measures, um, they've got us through before, they'll get us through again. We have time for one more question. We'll go to Ethan Sawyer, CBC. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. And uh, as per usual, hoping to get an answer in French as well. Uh, first off, just wondering, how does today's announcement affect private events such as weddings and funerals? Uh, will there be communication or guidance around things like seating? Uh, and will hosts be expected to check QR codes? Oh, and also, uh, what about capacity? <laughs> yeah, so uh, those events, um, yes, it, right now there are still limits on things like dancing, etc. So um, they re remain seated events. There's no capacity limits, but all of them, no matter what the size, must use the BC vaccine card uh, to check that everybody there is vaccinated. So that's uh, the difference. It used to be if only if the event was over 50 people. Now it's regardless of the size of the event. So if you have a smaller wedding, you can continue to have that wedding, but it can only be uh, vaccinated people at that wedding reception. Same for, uh, for funerals that are the funeral reception or the celebration of life is, what is the event part of it. Ethan, do you have a follow-up? Um, I do. This one is for Minister Dix. Um, you said there are 1,800 pharmacy appointments in northern BC with only 450 booked in the next two weeks. 
Does that mean there are uh, 1,300 or 1,350 unbooked pharmacy appointments available? And if so, why are you not inviting more people to register for their booster dose rather than let those go unused? We have heard directly from multiple people in northern BC who are past the six-month mark, including some who are over 65, who have yet to be invited to book their booster shot. And if we can get an answer in French for this one as well. I, I just want to say one more thing before I turn it over to Minister Dix, just in terms of, uh, of faith gatherings, uh, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that specifically, but um, you will recall about two weeks ago we put in place um, some additional measures to support safe uh, operation of faith gatherings over the holiday season, and that means the mask mandate was expanded to in include faith gatherings, and uh, the capacity limits if they include unvaccinated people at 50 percent, so that there's a, an opportunity for increased space. Yeah, so uh, just to give you a sense of where we're at in the north, we've significantly increased in the last couple of weeks immunizations across the north. Of course, all of long-term care, assisted living, independent living, long-term home support, uh, short interval health care workers and acute care health workers have been completed. Clinically extremely vulnerable have been offered a dose. Uh, 35,298 uh, northerners have received their third or booster dose. Um, and this is small, lower than it should be. 3,914 children age 5 to 11 have received their booster dose, doses. And we are continuing to look at offering more opportunities. The point I made is, and we sent out, of course, we're sending out lots of uh, invitations um, to book across BC that there are opportunities available. We do, we are creating new capacity and there is the possibility right now to book appointments. So we're going to continue to manage the system. I think the overall uh, effort at managing the system led by Dr. Penny Ballum has been excellent to date. We are obviously uh, working and uh, there are uh, appointments available uh, in communities across the north. We're adding new places where people can be vaccinated and we're working hard to ensure that because there's been some discussion about vac vaccine clinics that, that are going to take uh, periods off and stat holidays off and so on. Holidays working hard to see we have a maximum opportunity for everyone in the north to get vaccinated. But what I'm saying is that we're in fact adding capacity to the booster dose system and you see that and we manage um, invitations to ensure that we use those uh, those vaccination appointments. So that's what's happening. I think that the vaccination in pharmacies is a bit new and people are adjusting to it. But what I'm telling people is there are some opportunities for those of you who received your invitation to book to get booked. Uh, basically, we have a very similar number. You've got to look back six months. We're meeting um, we're meeting the test. I think it's 688. Uh, thousand people across BC have received their third or booster dose and uh, we're going to continue to do that. I think Northern Health is doing a very, very good job under very difficult conditions. Uh, you'll recall that 153 people, and that number has slowed a little bit, have been transferred out of cl uh, critical care in the north, but that is an example of how challenging it is in, uh, in the Northern Health Authority. Currently we've added resources from other health authorities, so people from Vancouver Coastal and others have gone up to support our Northern Health vaccination efforts. So uh, that system has been managed, managed very effectively through Immunization BC to balance those things off. And uh, what can I say? We're making progress. So um, those are the numbers um, that we have in terms of both uh, 5 to 11 clinics where there's availability right now and also pharmacy appointments available across the north. And we'll look to expand those as people fill those spots. But I'm saying that those spots are available, je dirais en français, Aux, euh, aux deux points que euh, dans la région de santé du Nord ou de la Colombie-Britannique, on a fait de grands progrès euh, dans la vaccination, surtout dans les communautés telles euh, Fort St. John et Dawson Creek, où on a ajouté des gens qui ont été euh, vaccinés pour la première fois et pour la deuxième fois. On, on, fait, euh, une, on a ouvert beaucoup de nouveaux lieux de vaccination dans nos euh, pharmacies euh, communautaires, un peu partout dans le Nord. Il y a des, euh, des, euh, des euh, positions disponibles pour des gens pour être vaccinés. Et donc, ce que je veux dire de cela, c'est qu'il y a la possibilité d'être vacciné. On a ouvert plus de, de lieux de vaccination et on va voir si c'est nécessaire euh, ou possible d'ajouter de, de, aussi des centres de vaccination euh, de la santé publique. Donc, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de progrès dans le Nord. On va continuer à faire du progrès dans le Nord. 
et j'invite tout le monde euh, qui, est, qui a reçu leur, um, leur invitation d'être vacciné, de prendre rendez-vous et d'être vacciné. Et c'est surtout important pour les enfants de 5 à 11 ans. C'est très important. Um, right now, as, as I noted uh, in my presentation, we have significantly, um, we have about 152,000 people uh, registered or children registered 5 to 11 for their COVID-19 vaccine out of the 349,000 who are eligible to do so. And we need that number to grow because the number of people of children vaccinated is growing and growing every day is now more than half of that number and is moving towards that number. So we need, and this is a good occasion to get registered and uh, cer certainly in the North especially to take advantage of appointments that, we may, that will be available for your children. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup and uh, I'll see you and uh, Dr. Henry will see you next Tuesday.